Hi guys, well, take two on chapter 11 of Peruvian Plunge. Thank you for hanging with me. Chapter 11, the bitch is hot. The bitch is hot. And where your intrepid explorer is still uh, ensconced at the Manu Wildlife Center on Monday, June 1st, 2009. And we're going to kick off this Monday morning with a quote from Anton Chekhov from 1887 in his book, An Encounter. What wages? I am traveling for the salvation of my soul. Yes, he is. And I'm going to put the little dog away and hope we don't have any more uh, miss encounters on this computer. Take it away. <clears throat> the month of June, allegedly the driest month in Manu, with only six inches of average rainfall, rolled in under a cold, wet, gray blanket of clouds and rain. After sleeping in until past nine, I made a valiant rally to revive my flagging spirit of high jungle adventure by exploring further reaches of the lodge's supposedly 30 miles of trails. As beautiful as the forest was, the relentless slogging through the boot-sucking ankle-deep muck soon devolved into little more than a pointless chore, so I retreated in defeat back to the shelter of the lodge. June 1st was, of course, the day of reckoning when I would plunge head-first, or ass-first, into my new role as volunteer English teacher to defend my tenuous claim that I deserve to enjoy this life of Riley I had stumbled into at Mono Wildlife Center for a paltry ten bucks per day. Fortunately, when the enigmatic Elizabeth Vargas from Cusco had actually accepted my bullshit proposal back in January, she had not asked for one scintilla of evidence to show that I knew the first thing about teaching English. No diplomas, no letters of reference from other places I had worked. Nothing. I guess that she, like me, naively assumed that since I spoke English, I would magically be able to impart that knowledge, perhaps by osmosis, to a bunch of young men who could barely count to ten in my native tongue and who pronounced the word sheet as shit and the word beach as bitch. I had had four months to prepare for this day. Time I could have spent doing boring shit like studying maybe one lesson about how one is supposed to go about teaching English to a bunch of native Spanish speakers or even doing something really crazy, such as buying so much as one lousy textbook for my native Indian village of students to share. As I had done with every aspect of my life, I had turned this job over to spirit, so I naturally trusted spirit would put my first lesson plan into my hands just as she had led me to the canopy of the Amazon rainforest. Fifteen minutes before I was to begin my new career, Spirit had not yet delivered this lesson plan from the great beyond, driving home the point, I guess, that Spirit helps those who help themselves. Fine, Spirit. That's exactly what I'll do. I gathered up my total list of school supplies I had amassed for my new career in the jungle. A pocket-sized Spanish-English dictionary, my 301 Spanish Verbs Conjugations textbook, which had completely failed to teach me any Spanish in five months and had nothing whatsoever to do with the English language, and the slick whiteboard and empty erasable ink markers I had pilfered from Kurt Cedar Rachetta's well-stocked office. 
having no clue how or where to begin the first of 60 hour-long classes I had promised to deliver, I approached the board and drew a big, fat, faint red letter A on it. Oh well, that's as good a place to start as any, I shrugged. I was about 10 minutes shy of 3 p.m. when I wrote the letter A on the board and sat down nervously in the empty cavernous dining room to await my dozen students, who, unbeknownst to me, were then half a mile away on the other side of the Rio Madre de Dios River, kicking around a soccer ball in the rain and mud and thinking about anything in the world except the dumb gringo sitting there alone in front of his pathetic little board with the letter A written on it. The dumb gringo was still sitting there alone in the empty room at 3 p.m., at 3.30 p.m., and when my hour-long class ended at 4 p.m., Fuck it, I kept my end of the bargain, I cavalierly said to myself unconvincingly as I stashed the board into its pitiful and its pitiful letter A in the corner of the makeshift classroom. Some minor sleuthing at breakfast that morning had revealed that no ecotourist had requested a visit to the treetops on such a dreary day, so the canopy platform was all mine. Thinking correctly that a few hits of weed would be just the ticket to hide in my treetop experience that I had found just a wee bit lacking the day before, I loaded a bowl and poured a screwdriver to bring with me to my rainy happy hour perch. I trudged back through the ankle-deep mud to the tower and huffed and puffed my way up the 144 steps arriving at the auspicious hour of 4.20 p.m., scrunching myself up under the dubious shelter of a giant branch that offered about two square feet of protection from the rain, I lit up and took three deep hits. I sipped my screwdriver as I gazed out over the misty treetops while waiting for the cannabis to work its gentle magic. The dance began in about five minutes as I watched <clears throat> the philodendron vine on the branch above me begin to take on a life of its own. The shiny wet leaves drew into sharp focus and seemed to wink out at me. I was soon drawn into their elfin ecosystem as I stood there studying the tangled mass of greenery. I began to notice a whole little village of ants, beetles, even a finger-sized little lizard peeking back at me. Considering that ants and lizards can't fly, and that philodendrons are not air plants, it boggled the mind how they had found their way from the forest floor to their rooftop home in the skyscraper of the rainforest. How many individual lives, I wondered, depended upon this one tree for their existence? A thousand? A million? The enormity of the level of devastation being inflicted upon Gaia began to sink in ever deeper as I thought of the planet eaters, the loggers, cattle ranchers, gold miners, hydroelectric engineers, oil and gas companies that were chewing their cancerous way closer and closer to my little treetop Garden of Eden. As if to hammer in the planet eater's point, my meditation on the beauty and the beast was suddenly shattered by the rude intrusion of some sort of ghastly gasoline-powered motor being fired up somewhere between me and the Mother of God. What the hell? What is, what is it? A boat? A plane? The arrogant growl of the alien engine droned on, mocking the soft sounds of raindrops on leaves. I searched my mental catalog of prime suspects to identify this interloper into my meditation. Of course, it was that fucking water pump 
I had stumbled upon in the creek the first time I had ever forayed into the forest behind my cabin. My ears had already been victimized by this planet-drinking spawn of Satan several times. The intrusion into the peace of the eco-lodge itself was bad enough, but this attack on the peace of the canopy was beyond irritating. It was nothing short of sacrilegious. The magic philodendron vine went back to looking like some house plant you can buy at Home Depot, and I went back to Butthole for a hot shower. Now that I knew the water tanks were full, thanks to the pump, before dinner and my second attempt at becoming an English teacher. By the time nine o'clock rolled around, I and everyone else at Manu Wildlife Center was totally exhausted from their long day. I chugged a cup of coca leaf tea for the energy to get me through this ordeal as I waited a second time for my dozen students to assemble. By 9.10, three sleepy-eyed young men, Luis the bartender, Marcos the waiter, and the Ricardo the Ricardo the cook were looking at me expectantly, waiting for me to untangle the unfathomable mystery of the English language for them. Five minutes later, a cigarette-puffing, scowling curtsita racheta breezed into the room, and I knew D-Day had arrived. Okay, Mr. Volunteer English, show us what you're made of. As confidently as I could, which was not very confidently, I strode up to the whiteboard with its faint red A in the middle and faced my four silent pupils. Kurt Sita scowled at the board, her bullshit register on red alert. With no more procrastination devices left in my arsenal, I plunged ahead into my first English lesson with the bravado of a lemming diving off a cliff into the Arctic Ocean. Who the hell was I kidding? Myself? English was a much more difficult language to learn than Spanish. Hell, I'd been speaking it for almost a half century and I still hadn't figured it out. And then there was my own sad personal history of trying to learn Spanish. Let's see, I had taken a full year of university-level Spanish, making straight A's in 1980. I had traveled to Latin America at least a dozen times and had lived there off and on for three years if you added it all up. Just a few months earlier, I had taken a month-long intensive Spanish course in Guatemala and was graduated as an intermediate level speaker, according to the school. After all of that, you would think I would be fluent in such an easy language. Well, you would be wrong. With all that education and life experience, I could not make out the basic gist of your average conversation between a bunch of Peruvian kindergartners, except for the words corazón, heart, the songs on the radio I have been listening to for 20 years may as well have been in Martian. This insurmountable language barrier is, in fact, the number one exasperating hindrance that keeps me so hopelessly alienated and alone during my travels through Latin America. I just plain don't get it, and I never will, and I was supposed to teach English to these guys? Yeah, right. The central difference between being a native English speaker learning Spanish and being a native Spanish-speaking learner English is that Spanish, at least, is a hell of a lot easier to pronounce. The language is perhaps 90% phonetic. Silent letters are almost non-existent, and it even offers convenient accent marks to help you through the polysyllabic words. 
even a bonehead like myself can pick up a Spanish newspaper and pronounce the words almost as per efficiently as if I were reading English, though I have virtually no clue what the hell I just read. The poor native Spanish speaker trying to learn English, on the other hand, is not so blessed. Imagine trying to negotiate the pronunciation of the letters O-U-G-H in English, starting with the word rough, you can add a T and have the word through. From there, add an H. <clears throat> uh, you can add a T and have the word trough. From there, add an H and you get the word through. A couple of minor changes and you have the word brought. Subtracting a couple of letters, you get the word bow. Obviously, the letter combination O-U-G-H would be lesson number 61 on my 60 lesson course. First, I had to get through the goddamn letter A, which is pronounced as AH in Spanish. The long form of A wasn't that difficult to explain, as it sounds like the letter E in Spanish, but the short term form was a real brain buster as that form of the letter virtually does not exist in the Spanish language. The sole exception being in the letter combination AL for some strange AL for some strange reason. Twenty minutes into the first class when my pupils, with the exception of the poor Luis, had somewhat mastered the word apple it was time to move on to the letters E and I. It wasn't long before we stumbled upon the three greatest roadblocks in the EI Spanish England Spanish English conundrum. Sheet shit, beach bitch, sex six. So for the next forty minutes my four pupils went round and round the table trying not to say in eco touristies please change the shit on my bed. The bitch is too hot to sit on and we would like a table for sex. Class zipped right on by and even the surly curtsita seemed satisfied by my performance. Thanks to shit, bitch, and sex, I had miraculously pulled off my scam. I was a full-blooded volunteer English teacher, after all. I dragged my exhausted ass back through the muck to butthole at 10.30 p.m. I collapsed into bed surrounded by the farts and snores of my nearby neighbors. Two days, Kurt Sita had promised me. Yeah, right. Tuesday, June 2nd, 2009. When I awoke to yet another dreary, rainy morning on the second day of the driest month of the year, I didn't even pretend I wanted to go mud slogging through the forest. Even the macaws and the monkeys seemed resigned to their soggy fate. Hardly a squawk or a hoot followed me as I sloshed my way to the lodge for a hot cup of real coffee. Perhaps the greatest benefit of hiding out in Club Med. The only two people in the arc-sized building were Luis the bartender and Marcos the waiter wearing his shell oil t-shirt, they were engrossed in their morning chore of lodge polishing. They would literally polish every square inch of the glowing acre of tropical hardwood until it positively gleamed. Any crumb or cobweb would be tracked down and eradicated with the ferocity of a mongoose dispatching a cobra. It was a scorched earth, zero tolerance policy for hairballs and dust devils in the temple to the gods of ecotourism. 
Kurtzita Ratcheta ran a tight ship, and woe to the lodge polisher who let an ant, or heaven forbid, a cockroach live long enough to be spied by a guest. Spying a spider approximately half the size of my little fingernail, Luis hustled to the bar of the Eco Lodge, pulled out a 55-gallon drum of raid, and hosed the ill-fated arachnid into oblivion with enough insecticide to take out a tree full of leafcutter ants. The bitch is hot, no? Luis chirped brightly, proudly demonstrating to his teacher what he had learned in his Spanish lesson the night before. You like chair for sex, no? Searching the grounds through the screened window to make sure the big boss woman was not around, Luis, asked, Luis risked his job taking by taking five minutes out of his 14-hour workday to pull up a chair beside me and pick my brain about some pressing item he needed to discuss with me. Apparently, he was fascinated by the Kennedy assassination and wanted to know the truth of what really happened on that day in 1963, when I had just turned four years old and Luis would not be a gleam in his daddy's eye for another 20 years. Whoa, that was a departure from hot bitches. In my best broken Spanish, I tried to explain how presidential politics worked in the United States. With pen and paper, I diagrammed out how the vast majority of Americans were living under the sad and confused delusion that the president was the head chief and bottle washer of the U.S. democratically elected by the people he supposedly represented to the rest of the world. Illustrating how it really works, I drew a bunch of circles and arrows over the paper to demonstrate how all presidents Democrat or Republican, white or black, reported to the same bunch of evil planet eaters who were the real behind-the-scenes bosses. To illustrate, I showed that Dick Cheney did not, as most people believe, report to George Bush, but that it was the other way around and that Cheney then reported to yet a higher echelon of evil mongers made up mostly of oil company workers. I illustrated how Barack Obama and John McCain both worked for the same dude, and it really made no difference who won the election, as either way, the guy who was really in charge of things was going to get his way regardless. Luis studied my little circles and arrows and acted like he understood. He wanted to know what all of this had to do with the Kennedy assassination, however. <laughs> Returning to my little circles and arrows, I showed how JFK, like all presidents of the 20th century, worked for a group of evil mongers called the Bilderbergers. Beal de Boogers, Luis repeated after me, proudly adding a new word to his vocabulary of shit, bitch, and sex. I explained that JFK, after he was put in office by the Bilderbergers, started running his mouth in front of a bunch of reporters about the evil ways of the very folks who put him in office, and his bosses responded to that by gutting him down in cold blood on the streets of Dallas. This was even better information than he was hoping for, and Luis started peppering me with questions about the New World Order, etc. Unfortunately, right about the time I was launching into my Spanglish exp explanation of the Bohemia Club, the Bildir Booger Queen herself, Kurt Racheta, emerged from her office. 
Like a mother hen racing for cover from the shadow of a chicken hawk, Luis jumped up from his chair, grabbed his rag, and began vigorously attacking a watermark on the windowsill. The New World Order and other conspiracy facts would have to wait until another day. I hung around the lodge for most of the day reading the story of the ongoing battle between the tree huggers and big oil in the unspoiled paradise of the Tambopata and Candamo River valleys in the extreme southeast corner of Peru. I'll probably get into this depressing tale down the road when I've gotten down there myself to bring you a first-hand report. For now, just let me say this. Don't believe for one minute that all that green ink down in the extreme southeastern corner on Peruvian maps means for one minute that the area is safe from big oil. As I type these words, my fellow Texans, Hunt Oil Company, are within 10 miles of the border of that national park. No, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, the 10 miles of Manu National Park, where I was, although there were probably in 10 miles of the other national parks. Anyway, I was still there reading the same book, alone as usual, when my 3 o'clock class rolled around. Needless to say, I was still there, alone, as usual, when my hour-long afternoon class ended at 4 p.m. The hour hadn't been a total loss, however. While I had sat there with my nose buried in a book, the sun, the sun had made its first appearance since I had arrived at Manu Wildlife Center 75 hours earlier. Hell yeah! I raced back to Butthole, loaded a quick bowl, and poured myself a screwdriver to celebrate my first sunset over the canopy. I raced out the door, only to smack in to a bunch of eco-tourists following their blathering guide across the bridge, heading directly for the canopy tower. Shit! <coughs> Risking the wrath of Curtsita Ratchetta, if I had been caught. I gave the herd of sheeple a ten-minute head start and silently, stealthily followed them into the jungle. Under a dome of brilliant blue sky, the jungle was awash in an alternating maze of light and shadow. <clears throat> Shafts of steamy sunlight would stream in from the canopy to illustrate small snatches of greenery, scraggly forest floor stragglers reached up on spindly little trunks in search of that life-giving 10-minute sunbath that would give them just enough of the photosynthetic boost they needed to grow another two or three leaves. Steam radiated from every wet leaf that the warm rays of sunlight, sunlight kissed. I tiptoed as quietly as I could through the soggy morass of the muddy trail and hid out at the base of the giant strangler fig. Scattered pearls of sunlight dappled the tangled mass of vines that wrapped around with each other on their mad rush to the sun-washed canopy. As it was now 4.20, I lit up and lost myself in the visual sensory overload of the Swiss cheese tree trunk. Twilight was already beginning to kick in where I sat on the forest floor, though the top of the 12-story strangler fig was still awash in full sun. I could just make out the distant voices of the eco-tourist enjoying the view from the treetops. Damn it, come on! The water pump from hell cranked up. The sunlight continued to climb higher and higher up the giant tree above me, and still the touristas lingered. 
Finally, I could hear the sound of voices approaching, and I dived for cover behind a giant fallen log until the tourist had passed. As quietly as I could, I snuck down the trail to the tower, pulled off my heavy mud-caked boots at the bottom, and tiptoed up the tower in stockinged feet. I arrived at the top of the platform the moment the infernal water pump sputtered out and died. Looking eastward, I was stopped in my tracks by a vision that could have brought Ansel Adams back from the grave for one last photo. The sun hanging just above the western horizon behind my shoulders was spilling its honey-colored light over the canopy in front of me. The rolling green floor of the dense canopy below me was already settling down to sleep in twilight, but the magnificent crowns of more than a dozen emergent jungle giants, flaming like 100-foot-wide candelabras, rolled off into the distance. All along the eastern horizon behind the great trees, a line of black storm clouds loomed over the canopy, framing the silhouettes of the flaming skyscrapers with a velvety background that accentuated their sun-gilded magnificence even more. To top it all off, the marshmallow of a waxing moon floated above the whole scene. In short, it was one of the most mind-blowing vistas I have ever witnessed in half a lifetime of traveling the wilds of Latin America. Of course, it was a vista that the idiot group of camera-toting tourists could have been enjoying if they had not been in such a hurry to get back home to their hot showers, but their loss was my gain. I just stood there transfixed, hypnotized by the sight of the line of sunlight crawling slowly up the crowns of the giant trees, spreading out toward the horizon in all directions. With each passing minute, the evening chorus of cicadas, crickets, and frogs grew louder. Bats began flitting out from their home below the canopy platform, circling so close to my head that I could feel the soft breeze of their wing beats against my face. The last rays of sunlight winked out tree by tree, and the first vestiges of the Big Dipper began to emerge above the treetops along the northern horizon. I faced the western horizon to watch the last pastels of sunlight fade from between the lacy treetops. I had been so mesmerized by the scene that I had totally forgotten about the screwdriver and my day pack. Settling down to enjoy the spectacular view, I nursed my drink slowly as day faded into night over the jungle. <clears throat> it had taken me three trips up the canopy tower for the magic to sink in, but sink in, the magic did. I was hooked. After one million years of climbing down from the canopy, I was home again. And after seven hours of being away from the dinner table at the lodge, I was hungry again. By my second night as a professional English teacher, I had amassed six students. After a brief recap of the letters A, E, and I, we chugged on through O and U. Things were moving ahead along smoothly, and I was well into the groove of my lesson when a small movement caught my eye on the floor of the spotless dining room that Luis and Marcos had worked so hard to polish that morning. I skipped a beat in my lecture to see what it was, and all eyes in the room followed mine to the shiny hardwood floor. There, sauntering casually across the floor as if he owned the place, 
because he did was a huge rat, no doubt sniffing for any crumbs that had been overlooked by Luis's broom. Nobody in the room, including me, said a word. There were six statues at the table, five of them staring frantically between Kurtzita Ratchetta, who just sat there stone-faced, not moving or saying a word, and me. With nobody moving to block his progress, the big scaly-tailed rodent ambled nonchalantly across the dining room and on into the kitchen, where a whole cornucopia of goodies awaited him. A tense silence enveloped the room. The five guys at the table shuffled their papers, pretending to study their notes, but furtively they were glancing between me and Kurt Sita to see how we would react. All that weird bullshit about possum invasions, all that overhyped concern about rips and screens letting the possums in was exposed for the lie it was. I knew it, and Kurt Sita knew it, and Kurt Sita knew that I knew it. At Club Med in the jungle, where ants were attacked with chemical arsenals, you spelled possum R-A-T. For Kurt Sita to make a scene over the rat would be to admit to me that rats existed in her carefully groomed, micromanaged world, which clearly they did not. For me to make a scene over the rat would get Luis and Marcos in serious deep shit. Rats simply did not exist at Manu Wildlife Center, period, and since they did not exist, there was nothing for me to comment about. So I didn't. Okay, amigos, where were we? I began again, and class went right on along without a hitch. For the entire time I lived at the fancy eco-lodge, I never heard the word rat mention, though every tourist passing through the door got the old possum invasion story. Returning to butthole, listening to the snores and looking around at the cutesy little prison cell behind the closed curtains, I thought to myself, Hambone, you could be in a fucking Motel 6 right now. Now that the great possum invasion secret was out, and I knew the real reason that Cursita was so freaked out about Boa's ripped screen that I might see a rat and run my mouth about it around the tourist, I saw no reason to stick around any longer. I packed up my pillow and my toothbrush and walked a hundred feet back to my beloved little Boa, I climbed under the mosquito net and peered out through the curtainless screen. The jungle was awash in silvery moonlight. The trees seemed to glow from a light born within. The last thing I remember was lying there, just looking out at the moonlight and listening to the crickets. Bye-bye, butthole. Hello, jungle. And there wraps up chapter 11, chapter 12, coming up soon.